All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope everybody is having a fantastic morning. Uh, I am fighting a little bit of a cold here. Uh, so if, if I go hoarse or take a drink of water, uh, it's just because I'm trying to save my voice. So um, this is a webinar. It's a live webinar. So if you have questions uh, on the bottom of your screen, you have the ability to chat. So you can click that Q&A button. And ultimately, it would allow you to ask questions to myself. We've got Jenna on here as well, and she can read the questions and get them over to me. I'm going to try and get through as many of those questions as they come up. I do have about 20 minutes set aside to go through a presentation I put together to really just talk about, you know, what's going on with the market, right? We're seeing a lot of volatility that's occurred really in the past month you know, a few weeks, year to date, and there's a lot of things that are coming up with it. So when we look at the big pieces that are out there, right, and you ask yourself what's going on, you can see the bullet points on the screen. Number one, the first thing we're going to talk about is inflation, the cost of goods and services increasing. The second thing we're going to touch on today is just the increasing interest rates. And what does that really mean? And what does that more in particular mean for you and your situation? We're going to touch on the global economy, right? Russia and Ukraine and all of the turmoil that's been starting to rise overseas. And then I'm going to throw out a new term that some of you might know and some of you might not know called cyclical turnover. And those are going to be the four talking points we'll go through. I'm going to give some, some real life scenarios uh, to help you better understand those and things that we're watching here to make sure that your money is, is working as efficiently as possible during these times. But then at the end, I am going to set aside some time where we can go through specific questions that you may have that, that might come up. So with that being said, let's get started here and talk about inflation, right? So many of you have probably watched the news, right? Whether you want to or not, you're getting hit over the head with the term inflation. And by definition, that just means the cost of goods and services has been increasing. And we've seen a pretty rapid increase year over year. You can see as of February, if you look at the CPI index, right, year over year, we were up about 7.9%. And most estimates are coming in higher than that. So when you hear that term inflation, inflation can be a good thing. Okay, normal inflation. And that's the key piece, right? The Federal Reserve, right, targets inflation to be right around 2% per year. That's the inflationary growth. And that would be an indication that the supply chain can just keep up with the demand. What we're starting to creep into is more of that hyperinflation conversation. And what that means is we see this big spike in price, right, or cost of goods. In wages typically can't keep up with that, right? So think about it. If, if, if something costs 10 or 20% more than it did the year prior, for the average American, they're not getting a 10 or 20% increase in their compensation year over year. So that means they have less money to buy other goods with. It hurts them and their family because they're paying more for that same product. Now, if you look at all the factors we've run into, with inflation over the last year in particular, 18 months through the pandemic, right? Inflation has been starting to creep up during this entire time period. And there's a lot of different factors that go into this, right? The first factor is, right, the United States gave out the most stimulus and aid compared to any other nation through the pandemic. And if you start looking at the pieces that we supplied to the economy to help get through this, we had the PPP loans for small businesses. We had multiple rounds of stimulus checks for individuals that qualified, right? We have forbearance on student loans that's still in place. We had forbearance on mortgages for a six to an eight month time period. We had a moratorium on evictions where you couldn't evict people if they didn't pay rent for up to six months. So all of these different pieces were already leading to increased income on a monthly basis. And then on top of that, we had the Child Tax Act that was passed in the second half of last year that put $300 per child per month into qualified individuals' hands. So let's say you were a family with three children, right? That's $300, $600, $900 of extra cash flow you were receiving 
And if you had student loans that you were normally paying four or $500 per month towards, you're no longer making that payment currently because they're in forbearance. So if you had $900 from the Child Tax Act and 500 that came from student loans, you just found $1,400 a month of extra cash flow. And what we found is people started to spend that money and they got used to spending that money. So that drove the desire to buy product in consumer spending higher, right? Which that's good for the overall economy in the short term. But what we ran into is with COVID, there was a huge disruption of the supply chain, right? So think about it. We, we have ships that are off of our ports that we can't even get the product off of them and load it onto semi trucks and then getting them to the, the actual retail public, right? There's all of these different issues that we have to work through. So anytime you have a limited supply of product in a huge demand for people to buy that product, the remaining inventory that's available has to go up in price. And that's exactly what we were seeing with inflation. Now, I'm going to go deeper into inflation later on when we're talking about Russia and Ukraine, because inflation has started to spike quicker because of some more international issues that we're looking at, right? And I'll talk about that in the future, but just know, right, we're anticipating inflation to remain high because of domestic issues here, number one, and then obviously international issues that weighted that because we're a global economy at this point, okay? When we talk about ways for the government or the Federal Reserve to curb inflation, okay, how do we slow this down? That's a question we get all the time. How do we slow inflation down? Historically, we would increase interest rates. And a lot of people, when I say that, they kind of look at me and say, how does that, how is it connected, right? And you can see a bunch of, bunch of words on here as I, I found a nice chart that diagrammed it off. And you see on the lower right-hand corner, it says lower inflation. So basically what ends up happening when you see interest rates increase, and if you've been watching the news or if you know somebody that's looking to purchase a home, you've noticed that interest rates on mortgages have already jumped exponentially, right? A year ago, a 30-year fixed mortgage was about 2.75%, right? Right now, a 30-year mortgage is pushing closer to 4.75%. So as interest rates start to increase. What happens is banks and institutions, right, are receiving the money from the Federal Reserve at a higher rate. It's called the federal funds rate. And that's what they're increasing. That means the banks and institutions get to charge individuals more interest on loans. So if you're paying more interest to a bank or to a credit card company, you have less cash flow left over at the end of the month because you're paying more money in interest to buy goods. And if you have less cash flow to purchase goods with, your desire or demand to purchase those products starts to go down. And in theory, the supply chain can catch back up, right? It allows that inventory to fill that bucket back up. And anytime you have more inventory than demand, obviously the price starts to decrease. It starts to put you know, a downward trend on inflation. Now, the Federal Reserve increased interest rates for the first time since 2018, last Wednesday, they went up one quarter of 1%. It was not a dramatic increase. We need to be aware that interest rates are gonna to continue to go higher in the quarters to come, right? And we could see them increase at a much more rapid pace than what we're seeing right now to try and get ahead of inflation. Right. So when people increase or when the government increases interest rates, right, what they're doing is they're strategically trying to cool down the economy because inflation has gotten out of hand and they view that as the economy is overheating. And this is where they're going very, very slow and they're being very cautious because if you're the Federal Reserve, you don't want to increase interest rates too much because you don't want to slow down the economy rapidly. But at the same time, hyperinflation is very bad for the long-term growth of the economy because you're losing purchasing power as it continues to get more and more costly to buy goods. So they're walking a tightrope right now. They're saying, we want to go slowly, 
One thing that I will give them a lot of credit for is they're being very transparent with their moves, which helps us as a company and you as individuals plan accordingly to make sure that we're making the right moves going forward. And that's what I'm going to talk about here is one of those things that you should be aware of as rates go up. And this is a conversation I've been having with a lot of my clients, right? Not all bonds are created equal. And when I say that, you can see on here, this is a Morningstar report, right? This is the number one bond fund that's used in 401ks. And I'm not going to name the name, right? But ultimately, this is the number one bond fund that's used in 401ks that's offered by multiple, multiple providers all over the world, okay? So when people think bonds, they think, I'm secure, I'm safe. And traditionally, that is more so the case, right? When you buy a bond, you're typically saying, hey, I'm taking less risk, I'm closer to retirement or I'm in retirement and I don't want a lot of movement. Well, when's the last time that we've had interest rates near zero for as long as they have right now, right? You think back, we started reducing interest rates back in 2008, 2009 through the financial crash. And ultimately we've kept interest rates artificially low for over a decade. So this is uncharted territory for rate increases at this point. So if my arm's a teeter-totter and interest rates rise, which we know they're going to, bond prices fall. And this is where this conversation comes up, right? Not all bonds are created equal. If my arm is that teeter-totter, the axis point here that does not go up or down would be what are called short duration bonds. They do not have a lot of movement because their duration is so short that ultimately they don't have to take part in the volatility. Intermediate term bonds would be here and long term bonds would be further. And obviously they're gonna be impacted more directly. So for example, when you look at this, you can see year to date, this is an intermediate term bond and we have only moved one quarter of one percentage point higher on the federal funds rate and you can see year to date, this bond fund is already down 6.04%. So what we see is there's a form of bubble that's happening on these longer term maturity bonds that people aren't aware of that we need to make sure we're ahead of. So your key takeaways from this is we do not want to hold long term bonds in the portfolios. We do not want to see intermediate term bonds as well in the portfolios if we can help it. You really want to focus more on that short duration if you're going to have fixed income in the portfolio to help weather that storm. Because we know rates are going to go up and they're probably going to go up more aggressively. And if they do, you can see what happened with a quarter percent increase will most likely start to see that trajectory continue going forward. So not all bonds are created equal. Just remember that. The next piece I want to touch on is the global economy. This is something that you're hearing more and more in the news now, as you should be, right? We're seeing a war break out between Russia and Ukraine. We're not going to dive into that deeply today, but I want to talk about some of the things we need to be aware of, right, as Americans, and we need to be aware of as consumers going forward, right? So we're not in direct conflict with Russia but we are in indirect conflict with Russia, right? The NATO allies are helping support Ukraine through you know, ammunition, weapons, humanitarian aid, food, medical supplies, et cetera. When we look at that, right, what we've done is we've sanctioned Russia as well, right? Sanctions are very strict policies that we're putting uh, pressure on their financial institutions, on their currencies, on what we import or receive from them and the same for our allies. So the first thing that we're feeling firsthand right now is ultimately gas prices have increased, right? Gas prices have increased quite a bit over the last two month time period, right? Over the last one year, they've increased exponentially. Gas as a whole, right? The United States is a mass exporter of oil and we do have oil reserves. So ultimately only 3% of Russians, Russia's oil that they export, the United States actually imports, 
right? We only import 3% of Russia's, Russia's oil, 600,000 barrels per day is what we are importing directly from Russia or were in the past. One of the sanctions we put on Russia is to stop those imports. So what we did is we strategically released 30 million barrels from our reserves, which bought us 50 days of time, right? And that's why we've seen uh, gasoline more level out here the last few weeks is because we released those reserves uh, from our stockpile. Just remember though, oil is not only used for gasoline, right? And you can see on here, and I put this through because this was a study that was done, somewhere between 30 and 45% of every crude oil barrel goes to other products, right? Anything with a plastic in it, shampoos, you know, any kind of microchip for your technology, uh, any parts that are in, you know, cars, dashboards, etc., all have oil or petroleum in them. So anytime we see this increase in crude oil, that means that all of those facets or products that are tied to that also increase in price. Remember, we're a global economy now. Natural gas is another piece that we have to watch on the European and Central Asia side, right? So you think about it, they had closed due to a sanction, the Nord Stream pipeline, which went from Russia to Germany. Germany imports over 60% of its natural gas from Russia directly. They close that pipeline. That means natural gas will be limited in Europe, meaning the cost goes higher, right? That doesn't directly impact us, but it does indirectly impact us here in the United States because we import product from Russia, or excuse me, from um, Europe and Central Asia. So if their cost to produce a product goes higher, that means our cost to buy that product also goes up, right? And that's where the global economy, we're really, we're all connected at this point. The other thing that most people aren't talking about is over 70% of the ground in Ukraine is farmed, right? They're a huge agriculture producer. And you can see of the global exports there, right? And that's directly off the USDA website. You know, 19% of all rapeseed, 18% of all barley, 16% of all corn, and 12% of all wheat production globally comes out of Ukraine, right? So that's a huge, huge exporter. We're already seeing food prices start to increase. And what we have to anticipate is they're probably not going to slow in the short term because food goes through a growing season. And obviously with Ukraine in the midst of a war, they're not planting they're not harvesting, they're not doing all of those things they have done before. And it takes a full season to try and replace that. So even if the war ended and they missed the whole growing season, it's another year before we start to see those stockpiles increase. So we're anticipating that inflation will stay elevated at least the next 12 to 18 months, right? And we can prepare for that. I'll talk about that here in a second. And remember, if you guys have questions as I go through this, please just click that Q&A button on the bottom. And I'm, I'm happy to stop at any time and address a question if you had it on a certain slide or anything like that. The next piece that I wanna talk about is cyclical turnover, okay? And this is a term that many of my clients and many of the people that I talk to are, are may not be familiar with. Cyclical turnover, is basically comparing growth stocks. So think of like technology type sector, right? More aggressive sectors in value stocks. So a growth stock by definition is a company that takes all of its extra cash flow, profits, et cetera, and reinvests them back into the company. And they're trying to grow the stock price as quickly as possible. So a lot of your technology companies, for example, are growth stocks, they don't pay a dividend. A value company is a company that focuses more on paying a dividend to their shareholders as more of a value add, right? You get an additional value by holding on to this through the dividend that you're receiving, right? For the last roughly five years, we have seen technology just shoot through the roof, right? And you think about the NASDAQ, right? It was going through the roof. You think about the S&P 500, it was going up, up, up. And people are saying, well, how can it continue to go up, up, up? Well, the top five companies in the S&P 500 
are Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Number six is Microsoft, right? They're growth-oriented companies. And those five companies at one point made up 26% of the 500 company index. So of course it was gonna go up, up, up because growth stocks were in favor. What we've started to see over the last 12 months is that shift. And that's in preparation as interest rates go higher. So as interest rates go higher and inflation continues to remain high, that means expenses for these growth companies are also going higher, right? They're paying more interest to their lien holders. They're paying more cost to their workers, more cost for insurance, more cost for utilities. They have less cash flow left over to reinvest back into the company for future growth. So their estimations on future growth start to come down and so does the share price. And you can see the value stocks have continued to perform during that time. So what's happening is people are selling growth stocks and they're buying more into the defensive type sectors, which the majority of our clients are holding right now, right? So we're seeing a flood of people sell out of the technology side and buy into the value-based defensive side to help hedge the volatility knowing that interest rates are going to go higher, those are much more insulated than a growth company would be. So we're seeing this large cyclical turnover that's occurring through there. So I tell you all of this, right? And this is meant to educate you. This is a 30,000 foot view, just taking a step back. You hear all this stuff on the news, you might read it in the paper, you're saying, what does all of this mean? I really put it down into four bullet points, okay? Four key takeaways. Number one, the U.S. is the greatest country in the world. I truly believe that. I truly believe that. And the reason I put that on there is we need to continue to look at, you know, removing some of the currency issues, removing some of the international issues that come. Most of our clients are tied heavily to domestic companies, which means they're companies that are headquartered in the United States. That gives you a huge increase in, st in stability and security because we don't have to worry about some of those international factors. One of the things that we're looking at, and if you wanted to go further into detail with this, I'd be glad to. We're also looking at what percent of sales from every company we hold are in Russia, right? Or are in Ukraine. And the reason that we're doing that is ultimately saying, okay, how much revenue would be impacted if this continues to occur during a prolonged or a longer time period, All right? So we're already taking a step back, but just know you're investing in domestic-based companies that are really, really strong. Stay focused on sectors and items that you need regardless of the cost and regardless of what's occurring in the economy. Right. So, for example, if the cost of things keeps going up, people will start to put off those non-essentials. Right. People don't have to take a vacation. You don't have to buy a new car. You don't have to do things that are not a necessity. And if the cost gets too high, people will stop doing those. They call those cyclical items or cyclical sectors. Stay away from those. Right stay with the staples in the more defensive side, right? I've been joking around and a lot of you on this call probably have heard this. If toilet paper goes up a dollar per pack, you're still gonna pay for it. If your food goes up, right? You're still gonna buy food. You're still gonna buy clothing. You're still gonna pay your utility bill, your energy bill. We're actually seeing those increase. You don't get to negotiate those, right? I use LP gas because I'm out in the, in the county where I live. Right, my LP bill went up 60% last year. I prepay, I paid a dollar four per gallon or liquid gallon. I paid a dollar 69 per liquid gallon this year. And I didn't even think about it until after the fact. I'm like, that's a 60% increase, right? That's huge, but you don't get to negotiate it, right? If you don't negotiate, it actually goes higher and then you end up paying more. So stay focused on those sectors and those items that you need and you will bode very well throughout this volatility. You'll be able to reduce a lot of it, number one, and we can get some short-term growth as well. The third piece is review bond holdings. We've already done this with portfolios, okay? So a lot of this I'm telling you, but if you have portfolios or assets outside of the Trinell Financial Group, review the bond holdings that you have to make sure you're geared more towards the short duration. 
If you're in long-term or intermediate-term bonds, there is a bubble that's there that is starting to deflate. And that's where I showed you that slide where ultimately we're starting to see that downward pressure that's occurring. And people think, hey, this is a safety net, right? I'm secure here. It, it, it traditionally is, but we're seeing interest rates rise and you will, you will be losing money in those holdings. And we want to avoid that, okay? And just remember, there will always be something that is occurring in the world, whether it's a war, whether it's a terrorist attack, whether it's some oil shortage or uh, something that's occurring. And you have to take a step back, manage your emotions and say, I was invested in really good companies before this said whatever it is. And I'm still investing in really good companies going forward, right? So I've, I've been having my clients take a step back. And if you have opportunities, right? So for most retirees, right? We gear on the side of caution because we never want to see you get to a point where you have to stress about your finances. We want to make sure that you're secured and so forth. And that's the conversation that we've been having, right? You were in really good companies before. You're going to be in really good companies after for individuals that are still accumulating, this gives them different opportunities that they did not have before, right? And ultimately, when we look at that from an opportunity standpoint, right, the Dow dropped, right, from 37,000 almost down to 32,000. It gives different buying opportunities and entry points for those that are still looking to add or accumulate net worth over a long period of time. So ultimately, just keep that in mind. We can use some of this as an opportunity for further accumulation, but we have to stay more long-term with our view. So with that being said, that's everything that I had for my presentation to go over. Is there any questions that any of you have on any specifics or things that you've read or things that you wanna to touch on? You can simply click that Q&A button right at the bottom and ultimately that will allow you to ask questions. And then once, once we see those, I can get them answered. If we don't have any questions that come through here over the next few minutes, we can go ahead and, and, and wrap up. But I just wanna leave that out there that if you have questions or something you read or something that's, that's top of mind for you, you know, please ask it. All right, looks like we had one question come in here. It said, what would we anticipate? I'm just gonna read this here. What would we anticipate from interest rates going up this year? So, you know, that's a, that's a I'm gonna give you my best guess, right? So uh, originally prior to the Russia, Ukraine issues that we saw, most analysts were anticipating that interest rates would rise quicker in the beginning to try and get ahead of the domestic inflation that we were seeing, right? The inflation here in the United States with Russia and Ukraine causing inflation to go higher, but it's an outside entity that we have no control over. The Federal Reserve took a much slower approach and they only increased by one quarter of 1% during that last hike last Wednesday. Ultimately, um, they have made comments that they're looking to do much more aggressive hikes in the future. So we could see a half percent increase in the next quarter, a half percent after that. Um, the big thing I can tell you on how you can take advantage of this is make sure you don't have any variable rate loans. If you do, you want to lock those in now. If your family members or children do, same thing. You don't want to carry credit card debt that's going to go up. Uh, if you're looking to purchase a home, get your interest rate fixed and locked now before rates jump, right? So those are things that you can use to your advantage, right? Because ultimately, if you can lock a low interest rate or lower interest rate now and it goes up a half percent, right? Ultimately, you saved your, yourself a lot of money you would have been paying uh, to that institution. Got another question that just came through here. Um, how much of housing cost is driven by consumer demand? and how much by uh, speculators purchasing available housing stock? So great question. Um, so there's, this is a lot, I actually have literally done a ton of research on this for another one of my clients. So this is a really good question. Um, 
I get a little excited because I'm a big nerd. So this gets me kind of jazzed up when we start talking about this stuff. So housing is one of those key things that if you look at it, it's typically driven by supply and demand. There is a huge supply shortage of homes, huge supply shortage. Right now, it's estimated that there is a supply shortage of 4 million homes in the United States, 4 million, right? And if you think back, we had a housing crash in 2008 and 2009. And after the crash, people were so cautious for the next approximate five-year period that we weren't building homes. And then we had the pandemic that occurred in 2020 and people were building homes, but it takes a long time to get the inertia and get ahead of that curve. So we have about a 4 million person or 4 million home shortage in the United States right now. So there's a huge uh, supply issue. The demand is through the roof because the millennials are fully in the workforce. They're not living with their parents anymore. They're looking to purchase homes you're also seeing second homes being purchased by income in, or higher income individuals that can afford them at the highest rate ever because they're using them as investments. Think about how many people you know that own an Airbnb, right? 10 years ago, that wasn't even a thing. So you think if, if you know, 10% of the population owns two homes, I'm using that as an example. I don't know if that's the statistic. That's 10% less of the homes that used to be available that aren't anymore. And then on top of that, we're seeing large conglomerations come in and corporations are buying up single family homes because they know there's such a shortage. And what they do is they rent them because their rental rates have gone up about 30 to 40% in cer certain markets year over year. So it, it's not stock. It's not Wall Street necessarily that's coming in and buying this in a stock, but it is corporations that are coming in and purchasing single family homes. Now, this is a statistic that really blew my mind when I heard it, is only 2% of the single family homes owned are owned by corporations. Most investment properties are owned by mom and pops or smaller investors. So it's not a huge swing, but temporarily we're seeing corporations buy them at a much faster clip than they have in the past. So I, I when interest rates go up, to answer this question, and I'm getting long-winded here, so I apologize. When interest rates go higher, we're going to start to see most likely downward pressure on higher priced homes, right? Your non-starter homes. And the reason you see pressure on those first is there's less individuals that can afford those. And when interest rates go higher, it costs more money. Those lower or entry level homes, right? And at this point with inflation going up, we're seeing the, the average be around $300,000 or lower they have such a demand that interest rates are going to have some impact, but not nearly the impact that they traditionally would because there's such a shortage uh, on that supply chain. So there's, there's just not enough houses out there currently for that situation. Any other questions as we have a um, couple Tyler, minutes did you here. see the other question? Are you in the Q&A? I, I am right now, so I can okay. see one here. So are we already modifying portfolio distributions to reduce the impact on the areas considering to eliminate and to include? Yeah, so we're already going through the portfolios. A lot of this we were looking at ahead of time. If you look at the majority of the staples that we hold, we bring uh, risk mitigation in two ways. We focus on sector specifics. So a lot of those items we had talked about, if you look through your portfolio, right, the Cloroxes of the world, the... Um, Kimberly Clarks of the world, et cetera, right? So typically consumer food, consumer staple, pharmaceuticals, telecommunication, utilities, and energy, right? So we're already holding those in the bulk of the portfolio. We also are bringing in what we call equal weighting to the portfolios. Equal weighting is a way that you don't have to be overexposed in any one sector, and you also don't have to be overexposed in any one company. So with the S&P 500, for example, that's called cap weighted. And that simply means that uh, any company can be a bigger percentage than another company. And that's why those top five that I had listed equaled 26% of a 500 company index, right? They were weighted to the cap. We're structuring towards equal weighting. So no one company outweighs the other unless we are choosing to do that. So that is bringing a lot of risk mitigation in the short term. We've already done that uh, for the bulk of our portfolios and clients. Uh, as we've gone through. So yes, we're already taking those steps 
you know, a lot of the, the clients that we have are in required minimum distribution mode as well. And that just simply means they have to take distributions. And that's where as well, and I should probably, if you guys were interested, let me know. I would do a webinar on RMDs and how to manage it through this, right? Because not all distributions are created equal, right? This is where dividends have become even more key during volatility. Because let's say you're 75 years old and you're forced to take a, um, you're forced to take a distribution of 5% because the IRS is making you, you know, if you don't have a dividend, that means you're forced to sell 5% of the shares you own. And if the share price is lower, right, that means you're selling even more shares than you should have, right? It multiplies your losses on the way down. Um, but ultimately, if you can get a three or a three and a half percent dividend, right, that dividend still stays strong because the dividend is based on the number of shares you own, not the share price. So if you've got to take out 5% and you get a 3% dividend, you actually only have to take a 2% distribution from the shares you own. And that way you're only taking a smaller distribution when the market's down. So we can help hedge that through the dividends that you're receiving. And the dividends have stayed very, very strong in the portfolios. We track that every single day uh, with our investment team. So that's, that's a really good question uh, that came through as well. So I don't see any other I don't see any other questions that came through. I went a little bit over the time that I had promised. So I apologize, I got a little long-winded here. I hope that you all enjoyed this presentation. We'll do more of these uh, from an educational standpoint. Please feel free to shoot me an email if you have any additional questions. I also love feedback. So please shoot me any feedback that you have in an email uh, as well. So ultimately it helps me continue to improve these and bring a lot of value to your situation. If there's other topics that you're interested in, also, please let us know, right? We want to make sure that we're bringing the, the best, most recent updated information to all of you. So hope you have a great rest of your day. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to sit through this. And uh, I look forward to talking to all of you very, very soon. Take care.